it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone here for this uh, conference, Exhibiting Cultures, Exhibiting Empire, Exhibiting Europe. My name is uh, Mark Elliott, and I'm one of the curators for anthropology here at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Well, I say here, just across the road where you'll be joining us for a reception this evening. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be uh, hosting this conference that comes out of the SWITCH project uh, that for uh, four and a bit years now has been bringing us together in different contexts and different places and different themes uh, to engage with the, uh, the issues and the challenges, which I think have changed quite a lot in the last few years, uh, facing collections of world cultures and museums like ours. Um, the conference over the next couple of days is really about bringing as many people together and about encouraging conversations. We really do hope that there will be some provocative, uh, some provocative presentations and plenty of room for discussion and feedback and, and conversation. Uh, and to kick that off, <laughs> um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our uh, first keynote speaker, Professor Sharon MacDonald. Uh, Professor MacDonald is Alexander von Humboldt, Professor for Social Anthropology at the Institute for European Ethnology at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and also Anniversary Professor of Cultural Anthropology at the University of York. And I think many people here will know more about Sharon's biography, so I will probably leave it there if that's okay, except to say that Sharon will be talking about houses of culture in times of unculture, potentials of ethnographic museums. So thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, nice introduction. And for me, it's phenomenal to be here as part of the Switch event. And I've been kind of watching Switch from the sidelines. And I'm really, really excited to find out what, uh, what has been happening and what you've come up with as part of Switch. Um, so I was really thinking hard, what on earth can I bring to this table when you've got kind of so much great stuff uh, going on, um, and so I'm going to, well, one, one thing I did was I went back to think about um, it, almost exactly five years ago uh, was the uh, future of ethnographic museums. I want to kind of focus on this question here of whether um, we can think, what are the potentials of ethnographic museums? And this title I have here about houses of culture in times of unculture is uh, a quote from Andre Heller at the opening of Weltmuseum Wien. And I'm going to come back and say a bit more about that later. But almost exactly then, five years ago, at the um, uh, RIME, the Precursor to Switch conference in, uh, in Oxford, I was really thinking that there was um, really wanted to stop and think what has changed uh, since then. And at that conference, I gave a presentation and a slightly reworked version of that was uh, published later in Museum Anthropology. It took ages. The referees kept sending it back. Um, maybe it's some of you guys. Um, but uh, anyway, it finally came out. And looking back at that and some of my notes, I really wanted to kind of think, what are some of the continuities? What were some of the changes? And I'm just going to pick... Uh, out some, some of those. But for me personally, these five years have been quite unexpected. I had no idea then that in 2015 I would move um, to Berlin, to the Humboldt University, um, where with the very generous support of the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation and also some uh, further support from the university, from the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and the Natural History Museum in particular, um, I've been able to set up uh, this research centre uh, called Karma, uh, the Centre for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage. Um, and within that, and I'm really going to just skip over this uh, quite quickly, but we have a kind of core project which I think has a lot of um, affinities with the SWITCH uh, project. Uh, so we're looking internationally at questions of what are some of the key transformations going on in museums and heritage uh, that are underway at present. We do so through a set of things that we thought were kind of key, key challenges, um, which you see represented in the themes uh, there, but we can be a little flexible with some of that. 
But at its core, it has a, um, a multi-researcher ethnography of ongoing um, developments in museums and heritage um, in Berlin. That includes um, uh, the Humboldt Forum, which I suspect most of you here know about. Yeah? No? Yeah? Um, I, I, I won't say much about it, because I might go on and talk for too long if I do. But basically, it's a, a new museum, a space for museums and uh, events, a cult cultural centre, um, that has been very controversial um, because of its building, its history, and also uh, the ethnological collections uh, from um, the Ethnological Museum, some uh, collections of which, or dis objects from the collections of which, are moving into the Humboldt um, Forum. It's currently in, um, in the making, and this is a picture I took just a few days ago, um, and it looked like that yesterday as well. And I think you can kind of see there that it's sort of trying to be of the moment, um, but maybe you know, slightly, slightly not quite doing it. It has very big goals itself. Um, and actually, yeah, I thought I was allowed to mention football today. <laughs> anyway, um, as well as... Um, the Ethnological Museum, there are other museums uh, and other collections within the, that will go into the Humboldt Forum, including from the Museum of Asian Art. There's also an exhibition um, that's currently and provisionally called uh, Berlin and the World, Berlin und die Welt. And I'm following that as an anthropologist as a kind of window into uh, seeing some of the uh, broader developments as well as looking at that um, in more detail. But with um, our researchers in Berlin, so I've been able to appoint quite a lot of fabulous researchers, and they're not even all fitting on the slide in this format. Oh, well. Um, I know it's not very readable, but I put the website so you can go and um, have, a look at, have a look there at who, who's doing what. But we're, we're working in a whole set of uh, different places around Berlin to try to look uh, at the ways in which um, particular kind of concepts of diversity and their relatives and difference are being practiced and performed in various, in various ways. Um, as w we're also um, a, a, a sort of umbrella for other projects, and I will just briefly mention one because I will talk about it later, and that's an EU Horizon 2020 project called Tracers. Um, transmitting contentious cultural heritage with the arts. And that's based on a kind of model of trying, instead for the usual, of the usual artist intervention model, of really working very closely um, uh, between um, artists and researchers uh, and cultural institutions. So in Berlin, we kind of, um, uh, we're the, the home of the contentious collections work package and this particular format of uh, these things called CCPs, which are creative co-productions, uh, you can see a list of those there. But um, I'll come back to one of those, but you can, you can ask me about any of these uh, further in, in the next few days. But it, it, that way of working differently and looking really for different kinds of collaborations and ways of working is a very central idea to us in, in, in Karma. And in doing so, what we really want to do is try to kind of move beyond that maybe those sometimes quite unproductive critiques of earlier museology um, to try to see what happens in practice and why, and through that, hopefully, to reach some kind of more constructive uh, co-criticality, as I've uh, been trying, playing with that idea to see how far that, that is useful in, this, in these contexts. Um, so anyway, in that presentation five years ago, um, one of the things that I drew attention to was the rise of uh, right-wing nationalisms in Europe. Uh, since then, I'm sorry to say that that has uh, not gone away, and in some ways it's even intensified. Um, and you can see uh, here on the left, in the so this is a um, 
2017 figures, they're sort of compiled at the end of the year, um, which countries uh, have what, I think, yeah, I think you should be able to see it, what sorts of uh, percentages of support for the right-wing parties. These things obviously hide a lot of um, complexity. So although, say, the UK looks like it's uh, under that 10% uh, amount, whereas back in 2015, the UK Independence Party, UKIP, was polling uh, nearly 13%, What's changed there is really just that the uh, Conservative government has become the um, part anti-immigration and pro-independence uh, movement, which also is the point to say that it's, yeah, five years ago, or even in 15 when I moved to Berlin, the whole idea of the calamity called Brexit was not even, even around. And that's, so that's how fast some things are changing, but you can see on that other um, <coughs> uh, table there, which is about changes over the last 30 years, that there is a, a sort of, not, not absolute, but in general, a kind of increase uh, t towards the right, so towards this, this, these times of unculture, we could say. So immigration was an issue five years ago, and that has in intensified <laughs> too. And that's especially so following um, what was being called the long summer of migration and the refugee crisis of 2015 to 16, when hundreds of thousands of people fleeing countries, um, in, including uh, especially Syria, arrived in Europe, often having endured life-threatening life journeys and terrifying border regimes. And that really is fortified debates that were already begun on one hand, playing into fears about Europe being transformed, especially culturally and especially uh, due to the presence of Islam. But on the other hand, also being a kind of staging ground for an enormous humanitarian response and what in Germany came to be called a culture of welcome, the Willkommenskultur. Um, that's had a lot of argument about it. So Werner Schiffauer has tried to argue strongly, and he's really done some really great work on it, that that kind of amounted to a new social movement that's really transforming society, perhaps leading us towards what people like Nika Forutan, who takes the term from Shireen, uh, Shermin Langhoff, uh, talks about as a post-migrant society. And meaning there that instead of, so the, the migration is recognized as fundamental uh, part of society, but instead then of people really being thought about in terms of where they, they've come from, really looking um, for uh, uh, connections across uh, divisions, uh, that those would uh, prevail. Others in the volume, and this is a volume um, that's on its way out, which when I, I hadn't really planned to do, but because of arriving in Berlin amidst all these uh, debates, we really felt that we should kind of bring people together to discuss what was happening and try to look uh, in the long, long term. So others are more um, skeptical about that as a major um, change. So uh, Serhat Karakayali, uh, for example, suggests that it's too localized and unpoliticized to really amount to any kind of uh, deep change. Whatever's the case, though, um, it, it seems that there are that those questions and those debates um, about migration, about refugees, they're certainly absolutely, yeah, still on the agenda constantly, and still a pretext for defensive nationalisms. So in um, 2013, I also discussed a number of proposed new national museum projects. Um, that was quite interesting to look back at. So there were plans then for um, uh, new national stories for France, the UK, the Netherlands. Um, actually, interestingly, um, those have all been abandoned. Um, though Austria's uh, House of uh, History is due to open uh, later uh, this year, having actually displaced some of the space for um, the, the, the Weltmuseum. Uh, and there's its website, um, uh, with this rather baffling quote here. Um, yeah, so in Austria, uh, 
nobody really means what they say. So, <laughs> I, I, Claudia, yeah, you're not, you're not, well, you're, you, you come from Austria, so my respondent's from Austria, so <laughs> you'll have to see what we make of that. Um, but, dis, um, but despite the demise of some of those nationalist projects, it doesn't mean that nationalist political interference has disappeared. Just last month in the museum's journal here that some of you may have seen, um, our European museum directors were warning about the increasing interference from nationalist governments. Um, with the uh, director of the Kunsthalle Wien uh, saying that was the reason for his quitting, maybe partly echoing there the late Martin Roth's comment complaints about the Berlin relate the Berlin sorry the Brexit oh dear that was a terrible a, a, a terrible mix of words the Brexit related um, rhetoric uh, in his reasons for leaving uh, leaving the VNA. The most dramatic case, though, is surely um, that of um, the Gdansk Museum of World War II, which under the Law and Justice Party in in, in Poland. Uh, really objected to the uh, sort of vision of World War II, which was not showing uh, Poland in the best possible light. And um, Pavel Machiewicz's uh, book about his experience, so he's the for former director uh, until he was sacked, uh, it just came out um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, on the one hand, I, I guess lots of uh, unculture around, but alongside those developments, undoubtedly lots of more hopeful ones. In response to the refugee crisis, there have been a whole load of museum initiatives doing that kind of fast response that is often quite difficult um, for museums, and doing so not just to sort of depict the plight of refugees, but also doing the kind of work where refugees or other, and other migrants are involved in the initiatives themselves. So if we think about citizenship, which I know is one of the key terms uh, in, your, in your switch uh, project, not, if we think about it not just as a legalistic kind of matter of something one possesses or not, or is accorded or not, but as a matter of degree shaped uh, from a spectrum of pot possibilities of citizenly engagement and recognition, those kinds of museums initiatives undoubtedly do have scope for helping uh, with greater inclusion, and maybe especially through the outlets for creativity that they sometimes provide to bring in two of your other kind of key terms in your project. So in Berlin, um, again, so my researchers and I have ended up looking at some of those initiatives even though they weren't particularly on our agenda originally, and nor were they on the agenda of those institutions. Um, so one of those initiatives, um, which m you may well have heard about because it had lots of news coverage um, and won various uh, awards, is um, the project Multaka, which was in four uh, major museums in Berlin. And it was advertised very much as tours by refugees uh, for refugees. Now, uh, researcher uh, Ricka Graham, who worked on that, uh, found that in some ways it's a little bit of a stretch, the way in which the term refugee uh, was used. And there were also, um, in some ways, the project didn't maybe draw out the full potential that it could have done. But at the same time, what her work showed was just how creative, actually, the, um, the guides were in using the museum contents to craft their own kind of stories about their own migration uh, through them. And it also sh showed how the work itself provided them often with quite important social networks, uh, which were very useful to them in other ways. At the um, Museum of European Cultures, another uh, project, um, this one, Daheim uh, glances into fugitive lives as its official English uh, title. Um, in that, the artist uh, Barbara Kaveng worked with the museum, and it was really the museum's first time of, in uh, the sort of words they would use, of letting somebody else in to do something. Um, and 
so, so Barbara was kind of the mediator, so she was the artist, and she worked with um, uh, people from a refugee shelter and created an exhibition. And I think you can see there uh, that it was a very creative uh, e exhibition, and I think that was a very important um, part of that. There are various other projects as well that are going on, so I'm just doing a bit of a whirlwind just to kind of make the point that some of this kind of... Uh, energy that we see around. So many of those projects, I think, we are participative, a word that seems to have become absolute keyword over these last five years. Undoubtedly, it can mean a really wide range of things, um, ranging from some kind of visitor interactivity to um, the sorts of projects like the Dalheim one, where museums are kind of opening themselves up and uh, seeing what, what might happen. Sometimes that can be quite a challenge, and um, Elizabeth Tietmeyer, the director of the Museum of European Cultures, um, talks quite openly about how nervous she felt about um, doing that, um, but then also now about actually how she felt that that was that really um, had been such an important development for um, for the museum. Participation too, key keyword even in some parts of the Humboldt Forum, it's absolutely central. For example, in the Berlin uh, exhibition. But I'll skip over a bit because. Yeah. Um, finally, I wanted in this list of. Um, list of changes to mention uh, restitution and I know there's going to be a, a whole session on it so just um, but just very briefly because it seems absolutely um, to the fore and also maybe the most stickiest in those attempts to decolonize the, the museum now this, that certainly wasn't absent from debates five years ago but there seems, I don't know, there seems to me to be a sea change really uh, going on. Certainly, uh, President Macron's uh, statement uh, at uh, Ugadugu last November about objects being, that they would be returned to Africa, that s seems to have been very important and it was a, a surprise and it certainly caused response from various other museums, but or at various other countries, rather. But it also, I think, came on the back of what was already a gathering movement uh, in, in various ways across, albeit very unevenly, across various European countries. Larissa Furster, who's a, um, research, a researcher in Karma, has been researching and also really activating for these issues uh, for many years. And recently, through this collection um, that actually you can go and download, it's free to download at that web address, and uh, so some of the essays in it are, are, in, are in English uh, there too. And also helping to produce uh, some of, uh, produce new guidelines that have come out from the German Museums Association, albeit with, with some uh, reservations that she has about those. But one thing she points out is that one aspect of Macron's articulation uh, of the issue is that he does this in a kind of in order to, um, so in order to restitute uh, position rather than the usual because of um, position, which insists on a kind of legalistic um, establishment of wrongdoing. Now, I know there have been questions about Macron's move, with some seeing it as a kind of political bargaining chip. It has, I think, though, um, it has some sort of uh, catalytic uh, uh, potential there. So just two weeks ago, um, the head of the uh, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, so the head, in effect, of the National Museums in Germany, mentioned, actually almost casually, uh, the launch of a book about um, a project of the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, um, that he saw that project really as being part of a move to what would be sh surely become uh, restitution uh, of... of, of, of well, he wasn't clear of something, of some objects. 
And that seems to me a very considerable distance that's been traveled in terms of the kind of language and positions uh, from, from five years ago. And so too, the project itself, so this is a project called uh, Humboldt Lab uh, Tanzania uh, that uh, is, is designed, it, it basically it's a project to uh, jointly undertake uh, provenance uh, research on objects, and here are some uh, of those, working between the Ethnological Museum, the Stiftung Preußische Kulturbesitz, uh, more widely, and the University of Dar es, Dar es Salaam and the National Museums of Tanzania. And that is supposed to feed into exhibitions, but also partly uh, via, um, via artworks that were created as part of the project um, as well. Another project I want to just very briefly mention here, which is in its very early stages of development, um, but partly based on Larissa Furster's suggestion, um, which you can read in a piece she wrote about provenance on our Karma homepage. Um, and she argued that perhaps objects might be set free and allowed to travel. And working in close collaboration with um, curator Jonathan Fine at the Eth Ethnological Museum, um, and he, like uh, the cu curator Paula Ivanov, who was involved in this one, have really been pushing for a long time for more of this kind of work. Um, and this new project would see objects taken from Berlin to Namibia. Um, and with the project itself, and hopefully involving local art uh, uh, projects in relation to the objects, then being exhibited in, in the Humboldt Forum. So what we see in both of those examples, I think, is that even within a framework that tends to be described as conservative, um, and maybe conservative at best, and where, um, yeah, d some of the developments have been maybe quite late and in comparison with some uh, other places, curators and willing participants in the countries uh, f from where those objects have come, um, and maybe they're actually also some of the energy caused by the activists and the, uh, those opposing the Humboldt Forum have kind of come together in, for more creative and inclusive kind of work. Also considerable discussion five years ago um, was the prospect, um, certain prospective developments that I think lots of you will know about these and renamings of ethnographic and ethnological uh, museums and we've seen uh, various ones uh, open, so including Geneva Ethnographic Museum, good to see people here from them, um, Weltmuseum Wien, uh, Musée de l'Homme uh, as well. Uh, we're still waiting for some of them, and maybe we'll hear more about those later, so the Museum of Central Africa in Tavur and um, the National Museum of Ethnography in Budapest and the Humboldt Forum, and no doubt some others. Um, each, of course, reworked within a partic particular uh, context that's at once Euro European and performed partly in awareness of other developments, um, not least, of course, through projects uh, like this one, but at the same time also very locally positioned. But what's the role of such museums, then, to move into my second part, What's the role of such museums in relation to questions of inclusion and citizenship in contemporary Europe? What's their potential um, as houses of culture in these times of unculture? And what I wanted to do now is just actually present you, to give a different kind of feel, um, present you with a bit of a reworked field note um, uh, that, that, I, that I wrote, and here fieldwork in, in quite a, a broad sense. So, it's early evening on Wednesday, the 24th of October 2017. Heldenplatz, Heroes Square in Vienna, is packed. At some point, it's announced that, that, that 7,500 people are there. Many more wait outside hoping to get in, or at least to hear something of what's due to begin at 7 p.m. There's a collective frisson of anticipation as we gather around the large raised stage. 
History is in the air, past and future. Built as part of the ambitions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Heldenplatz was designed for history making, for proclaiming of power, heroes, and imagined futures. In 1938, Hitler declared the Anschluss of Austria and his vision of a thousand year Reich from the balcony of the Neue Burg above our heads. I guess that most of their, those there know that history, but even if they don't, they must surely feel that there is something weighty and historyful about this place. The show begins to a roar of applause a release of that pent-up energy. What follows is a heady cocktail of music and dance pieces from across the globe. Knowing that the show's curator, Andre Heller, is famous among other things for the show Africa, Africa, I'm nervous that we might be offered a kind of carnival of exotic tra traditional cultures. The Australian Aboriginal performance early on in the schedule has me worried. But my fears are quelled by the clever presence of modern yodeling and jokey umpa music, stunning fusion pieces, and the sheer quality and energy of the performance. What impresses me most, however, is the crowd. The fact that they're there. OK, there's a free show. But also for the reopening of a museum uh, that, when it closed three years ago, was called the Museum für Völkerkunde, now reincarnated as Weltmuseum Wien. When Andre Heller declares that the museum is a house of culture in times of unculture, in Zeiten der Unkultur, ein Haus der Kultur, there is an even greater roar of applause than that which opened the show. So too, ah, I didn't have it. So too for the message uh, when he says, the message of the Weltmuseum is respect and care for one another. Well, maybe not all of those here voted for the green president who officially opens the museum and who won against the far-right Freedom Party candidate by an extremely small margin. Maybe they don't all see their presence as part of a statement against the move to the xenophobic right witnessed in Austria and many other European countries. But the spontaneous collective responses show that many do so, or are glad to have their presence interpreted as support for what Heller refers to as das Fremde, the foreign. And it's not just the show. As the new um, Weltmuseum Wien opens its door to the public at 9 p.m. on the 25th, immediately after the evening spectacle, Long queues quickly build up. The same is the case the following day, um, which is a public holiday, Austria's national day. With tanks and other military vehicles and soldiers grouped in one side of the square, it really was pretty weird, um, in one side of the square, as part of the national celebrations, many thousands of other people stand for hours uh, to be able to get into the new ethnographic museum. And actually, I only noticed as I kind of um, was uh, finding up uh, 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 some pictures that there's one person there draped in the national flag, um, which, well, it was, it was National Day. But it made me think, too, I mean, I, who knows what that means? I kind of wished I'd noticed and gone to ask them what, what's going on. Um, but perhaps it speaks in part for the possibility that such a museum can bring also strange and unexpected coalitions of people together as part of the act that museums have, that potential they have, of constituting publics. Now, I wanted to begin, well, begin with that. I wanted to include that, um, not just because Claudia Auguststadt from Weltmuseum Wien is my uh, respondent, but because that public reception, that anticipation and hope really impressed me very deeply and made me th think about whether we really know enough about what the public expects, wants or needs from ethnological or ethnographic museums. It seemed to me to show that there is a hunger, a public hunger for something 
for something that such museums might offer. So not just for any culture, but maybe some particular kind of culture in these times of unculture. But exactly what that hunger is and how museums might meet it, or if we think they should, um, that seems to be something we need to get more of a handle on. Um, now, it might be that many people were there actually to consume the exotic, to feel a frisson of difference from which they could differentiate themselves. But it seemed to me, and it's a flimsy basis, you know, from when the crowd roared and uh, applauded and so on, but it seemed to me that the museum could serve as a means of publicly expressing a commitment to a kind of society and values that it increasingly felt were, un under, were under threat from unculture. While those queuing for the museum were surely curious to see the new displays, their willingness to make that effort to come, to stand in line, uh, it seemed to me was also a kind of performative statement, um, a, a, a performative utterance of support for a world in which diversity is celebrated rather than seen to be something excluded or quash. Now, I don't have time to say very much about the contents of um, uh, the Museum Wien uh, here. Um, uh, to think about how much it might sort of afford that particular, or this particular current context. Um, its own stra its strategy that it has of concentrating especially on its own collections and history uh, may undoubtedly makes sense to highlight what is there and why, and also to tell of Austria's uh, colonial and Nazi entanglements, and the roles there too of science, of anthropology, um, collecting, and museum display uh, within these. That's even taken admir admirably uh, further with, for example, Claudia's own very thoughtful and partly self-critical reflection on her own anthropological and collecting work. Um, but can it be that the, a sort of focus on what we did and how, um, putting the focus there, could that potentially leave too little room for the voices and perspectives of those from who collections came. And does an emphasis on the past write in so many ways with historical collections, but does it allow for enough participation uh, from the contemporary di diaspora and diversity? Now, I should say there that actually there's so much in the Weltmuseum Wien, and I guess lots of people have been to it, that um, pretty much everything is there, is there, is there somewhere. So it's really more a matter of the weight, uh, the weighting and the relativities. And there certainly is, is some uh, that does some of these. And I want to just briefly there mention uh, sharing stories as one example, um, partly, uh, so this, uh, so Tal Adler is a, photographer and artist who, who's based uh, in Berlin working on the Traces project uh, now, so uh, which, which, I'll, which I'll come back to. But that seemed to me to make a really vital move within the whole of looking at contemporary practices in people's homes, thus positioning visitors or publics uh, themselves within the frame rather than leaving collecting to being just the act of the museum or of uh, aristocrats or academics. And what that also did, which I think is another very important move for such museums, is it manages to include Austria's contemporary diversity without kind of laboring it through kind of a mapping of migration perspectives or labeling uh, people uh, as, as, as migrant groups and so on kind of strategies that can easily end up excluding by marking as other through their very attempts to include. Now, there are plenty of other uh, exhibits at Weltmuseum Wien that involve audiences. So, for example, prompting people to think about their uh, family histories. But maybe sometimes there are possibilities uh, for debate um, which weren't, uh, maybe not grasped, or at least weren't at the time. So, for example, uh, the Munduruku 
uh, trophy head, which uh, Claudia uh, shows in the exhibition. Um, and I know from talking to her uh, beforehand that she really thought very, very hard about, do I show it? How do I show it? And one doesn't get much of that in uh, this, this in the exhibition as it was uh, uh, at the, when, when it when it when it when it opened, and so that seemed to me. And, and there are other examples of that. There are times when I think there is an opportunity to bring the public into debate that maybe one could grasp a, a little more. And I picked that case partly, and I guess I was especially alerted to some of these questions because of an exhibition uh, that just opened uh, last week, week before last, um, in Edinburgh as part of our Traces EU project. And this uh, is, a, uh, these EU projects, they're just so complicated, um, but this bit is part of a uh, creative co-production uh, called Dead Images, and it's been working with um, the Natural History Museum in, in Vienna, where they have a collection of over 40,000 human skulls. And basically, the museum doesn't really know uh, what, what to do uh, with these, and so the project has been kind of looking at that and thinking about it. And the exhibition is designed to present a whole range of perspectives um, and to really... Uh, raise debate. The exhibition is on until, well, I've forgotten, the end of August or for quite a long time. So if you're interested, you can go and uh, visit it and you can also become part of the visitor research, maybe. <laughs> maybe you'd be a biased sample. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, the way that that very much works is, that, yeah, is by presenting a range of uh, views. And actually it's been extremely interesting uh, the way that the, the curators and scientists say that their own positions have changed as part of the project it's, itself. And I think that's another very important part uh, of that. Anyway, final, final comments from me. Um, so when I look back at these five years, actually, overall, I feel really encouraged about many of the directions that ethnological, ethnographic museums uh, have taken and, uh, and are taking. Certainly, <coughs> things could um, go further. And there are, yeah, all kinds of uh, difficulties and challenges, political pressures, um, inadequate storage facilities, uh, insufficient resources for research, and for doing other things that museum staff uh, want to do. And I don't want to un underplay those by any means, and I suspect we'll talk a lot about those in coming days. Um, but amidst that, I think they're really very, very important and hopeful uh, developments. In a recent special issue of Museum, uh, Museum's World, uh, that I co-edited with Henry Litchi over there and uh, Margar Margarita von Oswald. We deployed uh, the term cosmo-optimistic, maybe, maybe we're a bit optimistic with our term actually, uh, deployed the term cosmo-optimistic to try to express the potential of ethnological museums, ethnographic museums, I'm using them interchangeably, um, uh, to reflexively draw on their legacies to help imagine convivial futures with and across difference. The volume brings together um, examples which hold such potential, not always achieving it um, for all sorts of uh, reasons that the authors really go into analyzing. And actually, I think that's really important, and we need more of that kind of uh, analysis uh, of such developments um, we, and we need, we need the developments uh, as well. And my final point, the term culture, um, yeah, the term culture, it is as anthropology and other disciplines um, have long and frequently discussed an extremely slippery um, and, yeah, multi-meaninged uh, term. And sometimes it's pretty risky, such as when it gets deployed, um, 
exclusively for high culture or when it's used to mean frozen, fixed difference. But the sense in which ethnographic museums can be and are houses of culture is, I think, one that emphasizes cultural creativity and dynamism and opens up the sheer energy and vitality of cultural expression while simultaneously creating a space for respectful debate and public engagement uh, with and across difference. And as a kind of metaphor, I don't know if this is going to work, metaphor for um, the, yeah, for creative potential, even in places where we might not have uh, expected it, I wanted to leave you with uh, this, this image from a group called Hybrid Space Lab who have um, some different kinds of plans uh, for the Humboldt Forum for turning it into something much wilder than it currently is. But we'll see if that might happen. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sharon, for some incredible questions to get us thinking about and the invocation to wildness at the end. I'd like to introduce um, respondent to that, uh, uh, Claudia Augusta from Field Museum Wien and uh, leader of the Switch project. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Sharon, thank you very much for this uh, great talk. And um, to be honest, it's not so easy to be your respondent. <laughs> and um, so, but what I really like when I listen to you is this feeling that with our work in anthropological museums, we can be relevant for contemporary society. And this is what I got out of the last four years of the Switch project and also of the former project, uh, Ryan, which you also mentioned, that we can be really relevant and that our work can also change things. But on the other side, um, this is also something I got out of the last, especially the informal discussions with all my colleagues from different ethnographic museums, is if we are really prepared as an institution for this kind of change. And for example, when uh, you mentioned the announcement of uh, the President Macron for the repatriation in a really big scale, we are not talking about giving back some human remains, for example, to the Maori. Yeah? We are talking about giving back um, artworks, um, objects of sacred and secret um, characters, and in a big scale. And I can imagine that um, this will be something which will change our institution totally and forever, because then it's not our main um, duty to collect and to keep things. But instead, um, it would be our duty to set objects again in motion, transform them from museum objects back to something else, bring them back to life. And um, it's also then our duty to create social relationships, which I think, from my point of view, are maybe more important, and I sometimes really, I like that the claim of the Weltmuseum Wien is it's all about people and not it's all about objects, yeah? So, um, but to do this, yeah, it's, um, for example, um, I think Sharon also mentioned the comment from Elisabeth Tietmeyer about this participatory work, yeah? Let people in. Uh, do what they want to do in your museum is something which is very encouraging for a lot of our colleagues. It's time consuming. It can be totally annoying, yeah? And uh, it's not for, for everybody, it's, um, but it's so easy to be a host and really step back from your position as a curator and put your ego back to the, um, to where ever should belong, yeah? <laughs> but um, to really, um, yeah, give space to other people. And so we are not really um, prepared for this from our education as anthropologists in universities. And so, um, and on the other side, the institutions, um, they have not the right budget for this. And um, in the case, for example, of our museum, 
they are, they are now cutting budgets and they are cutting the staff because they think, you, you are reopened now. What do you else want? Yeah? So they didn't understand that the reopening is a starting point of a museum and not the end of, just the end of a project. Yeah? So um, I have not a real vision, but I think that we should start thinking about if it's time for a fundamental change, a change of what an muse ethnographic museum as an institution can be and how to make it really open and um, maybe more a kind of a temporary place where we can see objects are going through instead of that they are belonging there. And um, yeah, it's, um, but this is always what, what for me in the last four years was when we're talking about how we can change was really this idea of can we, can we change in the structures we inherited from our predecessors in the museum? Structures, for example, of regional departments, which were created, I think, for another way of thinking about the world. And um, that it's not enough to decolonize exhibitions, but decolonizing museum is also going deeper into the structure of the museum. And um, I hope that maybe in a following project of switch in the next years, we can discuss this point um, deeply and going really into the structure of our museums. Thank you.